You are about to listen to Upon the Rock broadcast with Pastor Lauren Shakir of Foundation of the World Church. It is our prayer that each teaching will help build a godly foundation in your life. Please be sure to visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for further information about this ministry and to view more teachings. Now, here is today's message. You all have your Bibles? All right, well, we're going to jump into the Word. I'm going to have some scriptures on the screen too, but I also want to I want you all to be able to look at it in your own Bible because on teachings like this, you probably want to take some notes. Everybody have, uh, are y'all comfortable? Yeah, okay, okay, good. All right, so what I want to talk about, and I'm not gonna be before you all long because I know it's Father's Day and you all probably have things to do. Or we probably don't have anything to do, we just don't wanna stay here all day. So, um, but today I wanted to kind of talk about the stubbornness of believers, the stubbornness of why is it we can't just do what God called us to do? We know what we're supposed to be doing, but for some reason we got this stubborn spirit inside of us that kind of keeps us going back into the same thing, or we just don't choose to just fully embrace what God has given us. Am I talking to you all so far? All right, so this teaching that I got, and some of y'all probably saw it on social media, it's called breaking the feral spirit of stubbornness. There's a feral type of spirit. Y'all know the story of Pharaoh, right? How he had a, a hard heart and he didn't want to obey anything that God called him to do. And I'm going to relate this to us because we can be stubborn in a lot of areas. When you know you have a assignment, everybody say assignment, assignment. say it again, assignment. Anytime you have an assignment, there's always going to be another side of you that will rise up to kind of keep you back so you won't go forward. And it's a stubbornness spirit. And you know what? It's stubborn enough not to move either. You think you'll grow out of it? You think you kind of just say, well, when I feel like it, I'll be ready. But you know what? Some things you probably you probably won't just grow out of it because you have to cast that stubborn spirit out. However, God will give you space to repent. Say out loud, space to repent. repent. Now, that simply means that there's a level of grace that God will give you in order for you to get it right. He's not going to just throw you to the wolves. He's not going to just kind of just stop the blessing he has on your life. He will give you time and space to repent. However, if we don't take advantage of that time, we may miss out on a lot of things that God has in store for us. And so... You know, I look at when it comes to, I guess, the body of Christ, because this is a message not only just for the world, but for the body of Christ, that it could be you stopping your own blessing. It could be you, the one holding up this thing. You may, everybody prays the prayer like, I think I think I should have been further down the road at this time. But, you know, you you have this kind of timetable in your head. But how do you know you're supposed to be there? It's almost like there's something there that's stopping us from reaching that particular place. Because the Bible talks about that he's no respecter of persons, right? So he's not trying to hold anything back from you and give it to somebody else. There's something that we have to do. And a lot of times we don't like to do that self-inventory, but we have this hard heart about us that needs to be softened. Did I say that word right? Soften? Soften. Y'all know what I mean. All right. In the book of Hebrews, it says, as just, uh, as as has just been said today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts as you did in what is this word say it again today if you hear my voice harden not your heart King James Burton says right the day you hear my voice don't harden your heart like you did in rebellion don't think that you have all day to make that decision if you're going to follow God or not the very time you hear him say something or do something, that's the time for you to move. And anytime you delay, you're operating actually in disobedience because it's delayed obedience. Because there's a certain window that God needs you to move through when he says a certain thing and you looking at your watch and saying, I don't feel like it's time yet. 
then you then when you get ready and, it, and it's delayed then when that ship or that that situation had already moved on you miss God and so you can say Lord but I did obey you but you're like Saul who you didn't actually sacrifice the things that God called you to sacrifice you did it on your own terms and so when you do it like that God still is not gonna bless you and I don't know about you all but I don't want I can't afford to make any wrong decisions when it comes to God a lot of people think I got a lot of time and I can, you know, I can probably uh, miss it this time and miss it that other time. I don't know about you all, but I'm, I'm just not like that. I want to be able and I know I'm not going to be the perfect guy, but if I can stand it, I don't want to be able to to miss out on whatever God has given me. Am I the only one here? No. All right. Well, look at this then. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 14. Blessed is the man who always fears the Lord. Everybody say always fears the Lord. That means a continuous fear or respect or honor. The Bible talks about this man is blessed. If you look at the word blessed, it means to be happy, but it also means to be envied. To be envied simply means that, yeah, you can almost take it like people just hate on you. You got haters, but it's more than that. It's just some people just want what you have because they see that. How come every time you turn around, you got all of this favor happening to you? But the Bible says, blessed is the man who always fears or respects the Lord. And so you can have the choice. You could be the, the beginning part of this verse of the guy who's blessed and everybody, not that they want to be like you or be you, but they just kind of want that same favor that you have. Or you could be the guy, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. I met people every time they turn around, they're going through a storm. They're a storm within a storm. And it's almost like, man, you came out of one thing and then you know, they come out of this one thing and they just came out the car wreck. They come home and then, you know, the house is on fire, it seemed like. Then they come home after that and then the child ate the TV remote control. There's always something that's going on. And it's like, when are you ever going to come out of this? The Bible says the way to transgress is hard. Sometimes if you're just outside the will of God, things just start happening because you're outside of that. Remember I talked on the kingdom of heaven about being outside the umbrella? Sometimes just because you're outside the umbrella, the rain is going to fall on you a lot harder. Not saying that the rain is not going to fall on the just, but it's going to fall on you harder because you're outside the will of God. So the Bible says he who hardens his heart, which means I have a choice to harden my own heart. The devil's not going to harden your heart. God's not going to harden your heart. You have to say, I see what you're doing, Lord, but I'm not going to respond. When you do that, you have just hardened your own heart. That's why he says the day you hear my voice, harden not your hearts as you did in rebellion. Well, I don't feel like it, Lord. Well, you're in rebellion then. That may sound a little cut and dry, but maybe that's the reason why a lot of things are not working in a flow. All right. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. And I will give them one heart, a new heart. Everybody say a new heart. I will put a new spirit. Everybody say new spirit. I will put a new spirit within them and I will, I will take the stony or unnaturally hardened heart. In other words, it's not a natural thing for this heart to be hard, but because you take the time to harden it it becomes unnatural now because you have taken because I will take the unnaturally uh, hardened heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh or sensitive and responsive to the touch of their God you're gonna either have a hard heart or you're gonna have a soft heart a pliable heart that simply means that God can use you when it's time to be used but it only happens every time you respond the day you hear his voice now, God is always speaking. We have prophetic people around. We have a lot of different things. And, and everybody can say, God said this. And he's always saying something. But you have to have the word for you. And you have to respond to the word that's for you. Because you can't respond to, to the word for somebody else. Okay? And sometimes, yes, you have a, have a spirit of discernment knowing that if this is a word for everybody or is it a word directly for me? Is it a rhema word or is it just a prophetic word for the atmosphere? Y'all get it? And that discerning will let you know this is my time to move. Oftentimes, yes, it's, it may be through a preacher. It may be through somebody walking up to you and just saying something. But you got to recognize when God is speaking to you. OK. And when you hear that, that's the time to move. You don't wait on the goosebump. You don't wait on something to happen. You don't wait until the stars line up. You have to just move because the Lord said move right now. Y'all get it? And the more you do that, even though it may be risky, the more you'll see the more another dimension of God. That's how you walk with faith. 
God spoke to Abraham five times in his life, five times. And he was considered the man of faith or the friend of God. Now, I know we get people now that are speaking to God every weekend. I get that. But Abraham, the man of faith, only heard from God five times. But every single time he heard from God, he moved. That's why he was the friend of God. A lot of times we want that faith like Abraham, but we don't move when God say move. All right. So I want you all to go to your Bibles. We're going to go to the 10 plagues of Egypt. Go to Exodus chapter 7, verse 14. I have it on the screen here, yes. And you all probably heard this in Sunday school or you've seen movies and Ten Commandments and you've seen all of this stuff. But I want you to go to your Bibles because certain things I want you to look at and I pray the Holy Spirit will cause it to jump out at you. I'm going to take each one of these ten plagues and I'm going to show you how it relates to your particular life. Because the Bible says that God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, what did he tell him to tell Pharaoh? Let my people go. Y'all know that, right? Let, them, let my people go so they may worship me in the wilderness. All right? And so you all know the story. Pharaoh said, I ain't going to let you go. Who is the Lord? Why would I let Israel go? All right? And so the Lord says, if you don't let my people go, I will strike you with the plagues. And, I, and actually he said, I will kill your firstborn son. In other words, God told him the end result from the beginning. But before he gave him all of these different stages that, that we all read about. What am I in? Exodus chapter 7? Good, 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 good. Hang on. Let me get there. Because maybe sometimes we're like Pharaoh. We have that stubborn spirit. God is saying, let my people go. Or you go and do this. Or you respond this way. Or what have, what have you. You know, because you can obey your flesh because you're used to doing it that way and be operating in disobedience or you can obey the spirit. But either way, God is going to get his word across. And he will remove the hard heart and replace it with a stony, I mean, replace it with a heart of flesh. All right. So Exodus chapter seven, verse 14. Uh, let me look at this real quick. Mm, OK, yeah, we, we can go there. So Exodus chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Verse 15, go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the water. Wait on the banks of the Nile to meet him. Then take, the, the, take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord God of Hebrews sent me to tell you, let my people go so they may worship me in the desert. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff in my, in, that was in his hand, he will strike the water of the now and it will be changed into blood. Now, why is the now so important to Egypt? Let's open the floor. The Nile River is one of the most signature places when it comes to Egypt alongside with pyramids. But why the now? What is the now? It's a river. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Money maker. Bingo. What were you going to say, sir? Um, doesn't the Nile uh, meet up at a certain spot and then it goes off in two different directions as well? I believe it does. Fertilizes. So would you all agree that it's a, it is Egypt's level of provision? So it's the place where this is where the money comes from, the Nile River. And oftentimes, if you have a hard heart, it almost seems like the, one of the first things God will allow to happen is your finances. Well, he, the finances get hit because you're not listening to him. But you will listen when that bank account says negative. You will. See, that, it's something about when you get that bank statement and it says negative such and such, your heart skip a beat. Oh, you're going to listen then. See, that's why that's the reason why it don't have to come to that. But God says, let my people go so that they can do this. But you're not listening. So let me go ahead and allow the finances to be hit. So now you're in the red, literally, because you have not obeyed the Lord your God. It's amazing to me. And y'all know my heart, so I'm going to just go ahead and say it anyway. 
because I'm not trying to offend anybody, but anybody I get offended, I don't care. I do care, but I don't, you know. Amazing to me who people who don't honor God in their finances always complain that they don't have finances. It's amazing. Because God already said something in his word that if you honor me, I'll do this. I will do that. And we just think that we're just exempt from, you know, giving God what belongs to him. Now, is God trying to take everything from you? No. Give to God what belongs to God. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But here's my point. You can't expect the blessing to flow in that area if that is something that you are not being obedient in. And I'm sorry, people need to hear this because they will say, come and pray for me and lay hands on me. I want this, I want this, and I want that, and I want God to use it. But they are not faithful to nothing. And so, yes, it almost seemed like the Lord would hit the bank account because since you wouldn't listen to everything else, Maybe you'll listen when you can't pay your bills or if you see you see that kind of notice saying we're going to put you out and that fear comes to you and you start to pray and thank God for that. But that is that is God's opportunity to get your attention of how come you're not doing what I called you to do. See, it's never been about the finances. God doesn't care about the finances because he walks on gold. So but he does know that the cares of life for us is wrapped up in finances. So yes, that's the first thing it looked like will happen uh, because whenever you don't see that level of provision, now you got to step in faith now. See, at first when everything was met, you didn't want to pray. God was like more of an option. After all, I got my needs met. But what happens when you don't have that provision there? Then all of a sudden you're a man or a woman of faith because I'm expecting God to, to, to provide because I'm his child. You get real spiritual then because something just hit your house. So here's my first point when it comes to the blood is whenever you have a hard heart and whatever you have this stubbornness spirit about you, often, oftentimes God will allow something like this to come to your life because you wasn't listening to anything else. Verse 20. Moses and Aaron did just what the Lord commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile and the water was changed to blood. Everybody who's in obedience with God is not experiencing the blood, but everybody else who's in disobedience is, is uh, hit with the result of blood. The fish in the Nile died. That's the finances, the money, the savings account. And the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. The blood was everywhere in Egypt. It's like everywhere you turned around, there's no help. There's no handout. Why? Because you're somewhere hard when it comes to God. It's somewhere in an area where you have to say, Lord, am I in, diso am I in disobedience or am I in obedience? Because God is not going to just allow certain things to happen to you. Now, there are certain, there are certain times where you, have to, where you will go through a, I would say, a testing storm. Um, because you've been safe on that level for too long. Like Job, have you considered my servant Job? It's not that he was trying to test Job, he just knew what was inside of Job. And a lot of times you go through a certain testing because it's, it's time for you to come to the next level, all right? But there are some times where it's not time to be on the next level, you're just in disobedience. All right, so watch this. The blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians tried, uh, well, I'm sorry, but the Egyptian, ma Egyptian magicians did the same thing by their secret arts and Pharaoh's heart became what? Hard. Pharaoh's heart became hard. When he see that, oh, anybody can do this, there's nothing supernatural about it, then all of a sudden, since you know how to connect the dots, you're going to try to rationalize it and say that wasn't God. So it gives you another excuse to stay in your stubbornness. And a lot of times when it comes to men, we wrestle with a stubborn spirit. Don't we, brother? We do because a lot of times we, we can kind of like think things through and say, well, you know what? I can, I don't have to do it like that. I can just get away with it. And that stubbornness kind of keeps us in an area where God can't use us. And, you know, I thank God. I thank God for, you know, women who come and support the body of Christ. But it always hurts my heart when I don't see a lot of men. Only because I think God is trying to speak to us as men, 
but we're too stubborn to respond. Women can be a little bit more sensitive when it comes to heart things. They, they can just hear it better. But with men, it's almost like God got to break us down sometimes just to get us to respond. And it's sad. But that's why we have to be like, you know, the person who has a humble heart. Because if, if the man decides to live for God and do the things of God, things will start to change. All right. But we have to get beat down sometimes. And sometimes we got to fall in and come right back out because it's like you're not going to learn until you fall. Let's keep going. Pharaoh's heart became hard. He did not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even not even take this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get a drink of water because they could not drink the water from the river. And so you have this part of you where you're trying to make it happen yourself. You're not getting on your face and asking God help or Lord, uh, it could it be me, but you're trying to figure it out on your own. And we all go through that. Whenever you hit a crisis, you start going to defense mode and starting to put everything together yourself. And it's like, it's not going to work. All of your plans of digging and trying to find a drink of water, you may get lucky a little bit, but it's not sustaining you. Are y'all hearing me so far? All right. So let's go to the next plague. What's what? The frogs. Chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. Yes, you have it in your Bible. Let me just read this because this is a, a pretty lengthy teaching. But why are frogs so significant? How come he didn't use birds? How come he didn't use roaches? Why he got to use frogs? Well, frogs in some of the parts of Egyptian were like a part of their gods. It wasn't the God like, yeah, what something they worship. It wasn't like raw, but it was something that they hold dear. So they didn't want to kill the frogs because it's almost like my God. It's not the God I worship, but it's something very important to me. And it's almost like God will allow the very thing that you say that, you know, I don't want this, you know, let's just say uh, sports. Let's just use sports, for example. I don't worship sports, but I just like sports. Now you got so much of it that it's taken all of your attention from God that you are just consumed. See, anything you do in excess can actually get you out, outside the will of God. You may say it's harmless, but now it gets to the point where it grows so much that it, it's everywhere. Now watch this. Verse, uh, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, go unto Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go. It's the same word. Keep going back. He didn't change his mind. Let my people go so they may worship me. And uh, the now will, will team, I'm sorry, the, the, the screen is a little mess up, with, with frogs. It was team with frogs. They will come into your palaces and on your bedrooms and into your beds and into your houses and on your officials and all of your people and to the ovens and the kneading bowls. The frogs will go up on you and your people and all your officials. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came and covered the land. The magicians did the same thing by their secret arts and they also made frogs come up from the land. Now that's interesting to me because when it keeps talking about the magicians tried to copy, you gotta watch how people are always trying to take the place of God when it comes to different things in your life. Now, a lot of times people can say, that wasn't God, that was me. I provided for you, or I did this, it's because this, this paycheck, or this and that. And you know what, for a time, the frogs, let's just say that the frogs may be somebody's career, their job. For a time, yeah, it was providing for you and it was just fine, but then it gets to the point where now that, that job or that career is taking the place of God in your life. And now you can't get any more victory because everywhere, your whole life is consumed about trying to keep up with this lifestyle. Your whole life is consumed about what I got to do next. I got I to gotta knock out these, uh, what is it, this to-do list. I got all these responsibilities. It's not something that I worship, but it's something that's taking my attention away from God. You see what I'm saying? And it's almost like you, when you see yourself drifting because you're just doing so much and doing other things, you got to stop and say, wait a minute, something is not right. My heart is starting to drift from the things of God. Because everywhere I look, there's frogs. There's frogs in my cabinets. There's frogs in my bed. There's frogs everywhere. All right? So, what else do I have right here? 
So Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me. There comes a point where you just say, all right, I get it. I get it. I'm going to pray and I'm going to get back to the things of God. We all have these kind of ideas. I'm getting back to the things of God. And I will let your people go. Lord, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. Okay? Just get me out of this thing. Get me out of this ditch. Get me out of all of this stress and all of this pressure. Right? After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Egypt. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses and the courtyards and the fields. And they were piled into heaps. And the land reeked of them. But Pharaoh saw that there was relief. And watch this. He hardened his what? He hardened his heart. So in other words, I got the prayer answered. It doesn't look like things are going to go bad. It doesn't look like this is going to happen. So I'm just going to go right back into what I was doing before. See, a lot of times, the reason why God doesn't answer the prayers is because he knows you're going to harden your heart again. Now, I think this is a word for all of us because all of us have been in places where we promise God, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. Right. But then when God gets you out of it, you find a way to go right back into the same thing you were doing before. You'll rationalize it as, oh, the magicians did it or it was something that, you know, uh, that wasn't that hard in the first place. I guess I can't go back to it because after all, it wasn't that harmful. All right. So you got to look at how you respond when God starts to answer things, because when he answers it, that's, that's another way for him to see that you can soften your heart so that you can respond in the day he speaks to you. OK. All right. Now, lice, we're just going through this because it's 10 of them. So forgive me if I'm going too fast. Oh, lice, lice. Now, I had some notes here and my page is just turned, but. Let's go ahead and, and read this. In fact, while I'm finding my notes, somebody just read chapters 8, verse 16 through 19 real quick as I find this. It doesn't matter who. Then the Lord said to Moses, mm -hmm. Say to Aaron, stretch out your staff to strike the dust of the ground, mm -hmm. and it will become biting gnats mm -hmm. or lice mm -hmm. throughout the land. They did so, and Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were biting gnats on man and animal. All the dust of the land became gnats through all the land of Egypt. The magicians, or the soothsayer priests, tried by their secret arts and enchantments to create gnats, but they could not, and there were gnats on men and animals. All right, that's 19. Just as the Lord had said. All right. So the nets, they said they were biting, they were stinging, they were coming out from everywhere and they were uh, inflicting that kind of pain. Now, I can't find my notes where I wrote down one of the things, but I do know this. When it comes to lice, it's small. You can barely see it, but you can feel the effects of it. Now, I know that's a gross picture right there and some of y'all can't even look at it. Yeah. Some of y'all looking away, but you know what? I want you to feel that. That's why I put that gross thing up there. So y'all like, oh Lord, but that's exactly how we look in the spirit is that you have this stuff that's attached to you that's actually inflicting diseases or, or, or different things in, in, in your body. And it's like, yeah, it's disgusting. It really is. But the gnats will be everywhere. He says, strike the dust and gnats will come out. And so I saw that when it comes to the, um, to the lice is, you know, you, you go to this, you go through this part where you didn't listen with the finances, you didn't listen with everything else. And now here comes something that's actually attacking you. It could be attacking, let's just say your family, something from the outside that's attacking you. It can be attacking your physical body. We're going to get into that a little bit deeper, but it seems like there's, there's always just, just something that's out there. That's trying to, you know, bring you down. It could be the spirit of heaviness. It can be the spirit of rejection. 
Uh, it can be a lot of things that's, that's gone, but it, it came, it's almost like it came out of nowhere. You're not the same anymore. You see what I'm saying? It's like things about you that, that made you who you were, it's like sucking the life out of you to such a point. Now, uh, the Bible says that the magicians tried to produce it, but they could not. And they said, this is the finger of God. So there comes a point where you can't rationalize it this time. You can't connect the dots and say, oh, that just happened by happenstance. No, you know, this is God's hand in this. The reason why this is happening to me is because I'm not in obedience when it comes to God. I got to check my heart because I have a lot of things going on when it comes to where I'm sleeping and what I'm eating and, and everything else. And if I'm not careful, these things can produce such diseases on me that it can actually kill me. Now, I'm talking about kill you spiritually now, all right, because it is possible that you can be walking with God one season of your life. Something comes in and happens, and now all of a sudden you don't want to walk with God anymore. I've seen a lot of people throw away their salvation and go right back into the world. I see that as the lice. Now, this is how I looked at it, because, you know, it wasn't there at first. But all of a sudden you went through some kind of patch and all of a sudden these things are attached to you. Now, I never had lice, but I'm told that it's very hard to get it out. Right. So you got to use all kind of powders and shampoos and throw away your clothes and burn your clothes or whatever. But you got you got something on you that's attached that is not going to let you go. You see what I'm saying? And that's when most people, if they're smart, they'll wake up and say, Lord, I don't want my life to look like this. But you get some people who even though they know that's the hand of God, the Bible says, but Pharaoh's heart was hard. They still will refuse to do what God called them to do. The Bible talks about in the last days in Revelations that after um, all of the, it talks about plagues too, but after God struck people with all the hot sun and everything, they still wouldn't repent for their ways. There are certain things that's on people, a stubborn spirit that's so strong that no matter what happens, you're still not gonna change. And it's going to take, well, I'm going I'm to show you, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it may take a lot just for you to really just recognize that maybe that wasn't, maybe that was, was not me. That was, well, maybe that wasn't, you know, just the thing of God, but I hardened my own heart. All right, now watch this. Flies. Let's go to the next one. Y'all get anything out of this so far? All right. Now, flies, I'm going to, well, in fact, Let's just read chapter 8, verse 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the water and say to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so they may worship me. Again, the same word keep coming back and forth. It's like every time you turn around, you keep hearing that same thing. That's how you know the assignment that's on your life is because you can't get away from that particular word. You go around the corner and somebody else is saying the same thing. They may say it in Spanish or whatever, but it's the same word. So he says, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so they may worship me. The Lord did this, and, and the Lord did this. Dense swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palaces and houses, and his officials throughout the Egypt of the land was ruined by flies. And you look at it like, flies? I mean, flies, they're just, they're just bugging you. But if you look at that word flies, and you, and you search it out in the original meaning, it actually means mosquitoes. Now, flies may bug you, but mosquitoes, how I many of you know that's, and let's just say billions and billions of billions of them, because when God did something, he did it to the max. He didn't just send you one little, two little mosquito bites. No, you're talking about thousands of mosquitoes on you, and they had no such thing as off at that time. All right, so you had flies. It's translated to flies, but it's actually mosquitoes. That's the thing that sucks the blood out of you. That's the thing that sucks the life out of you, that dryness. Is there it's not like the stinging things like the like the uh, the uh, lice but this is sucking something out of you now causing you to be just an empty shell so you got to understand something God doesn't want you to get this far out to the point where you don't have any love for him anymore but there are certain things that's, that may be attached like the mosquitoes that's sucking you sucking you dry and now you're just kind of just existing through life that's the time to wake up my life doesn't supposed to be like this I don't supposed to be just a shell sucking the lifeblood out of me. Are y'all hearing me? Yes. But some people are content with the flies being attached to them. 
well, as long as I'm not dead, I'm all right. No, but you're not the same anymore. Y'all get it? The joy of the Lord is your strength. And uh, in one translation, I think it's the Amplified, where they said Satan is the Lord of the flies. He's the Lord of the one who's sucking you dry. All right? So you got to be very, very careful on how you respond when God is saying, I need you to let my people go. And all it takes is just your act of obedience, wholehearted obedience. If you just do what God called you to do, he'll remove the flies. But some people just insist on thinking that they can outdo God. All right. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. Go sacrifice to your God here in the land. See, here he goes trying to compromise. God did not say in the land. He said, go into the what? Wilderness. But a lot of times we try to kind of put God in a box. I'll do it. But if you do it on my terms, you see what I'm saying? If you start compromising on God, said, I'll do it on my terms and I won't do it the way I want you to do it, Lord. That's still disobedience. So he says, I'll do it. But just make sure you're in here in my land where I can still have control. See, that stubborn spirit about Pharaoh always wanted control, all right? Some things you gotta give God control. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron, go sacrifice to your Lord here in the land. But Moses said, that would not be right. The sacrifices we offer to the Lord our God will be detestable to the Egyptians. If we offer the sacrifices there, they are detestable in their eyes, they will stone us. We must take a three day journey into the desert and offer the sacrifices to the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Pharaoh said, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the desert, but you must not go very far from me. Now pray for me. In other words, you see how he's still trying to keep control over how God is going to bless him. If you really want the blessing of the Lord, you have to just say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. But if you insist on putting boundaries around God, you're going to have to bless me right here the way I feel like it. Then God is not going to answer that prayer. He still had the audacity to say, now pray for me, though. I mean, think about that. I'm going to give you my terms, God, but I want you to bless me the way I want. So I need you to you know, pray for me or I need you to you know, let this blessing fall on me then. It's not going to happen that way. Either you're going to be all the way in obedience or you're in disobedience. There's no real gray area when it comes to this. So it's a stubborn spirit. Pharaoh doesn't recognize that he had a stubborn spirit. That he, keep, he keeps hardening his heart. He keeps on hardening his heart. And then the Bible talks about that he just, you know, well, I'll, I'll keep getting ahead of myself. I don't want to go ahead. Y'all get anything, right? Y'all fine? All right. All right. As soon, Moses said, as soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord and tomorrow the flies or mosquitoes will leave Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Only be sure that Pharaoh does not act deceitfully again by not letting the people go to offer sacrifice to the Lord. Then Moses left Pharaoh, prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did what Moses asked. The mosquitoes, flies, left Pharaoh and his officials and his people, and not a mosquito remained. But this time also Pharaoh what hardened his heart and would not let the people go. I don't know what's wrong with this boy, but we look at him like, you crazy, but we live our lives just like that every day. I mean, it may not happen as fast as, I don't even know how, how long this time frame was, but in the period of our lifetime, we go through almost like these stages. And so it's like, I serve you, and then once you bless me, I'm going right back to where I was used to. So he, Pharaoh hardened his heart again. Livestock. It's almost like the now, but a little bit different. Then the Lord said to Moses, chapter 9, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the Lord, your God of Hebrews says, let my people go and keep on echoing the same thing so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock and field. On your horses, your donkeys, your camels, your cattle, your sheep, your goats. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt so that no animal belonging to the Israelites will die. So the Lord set a time. Everybody say the Lord set a time. Say it again. The Lord set a time. In other words, there's a certain season, a certain time that if you don't 
decide to get into obedience when it comes to God, you may run out of this time. And then once God hits this moment, then it's actually, that's, this is the fifth plague. So that's a halfway point. We all know that's a halfway point. But once this moment hits, you may not be able to recover. See, at first it was like the Nile River. You probably lost your job or you probably had some negative things happen. But now it's like everything you're working on is dying. Anything you put your hands to is dying. You may start a business, it's not gonna work. You may try to go and help somebody else out, it's not gonna work. You may try to do all different types of things, but it's like everywhere you touch, it's dying. But everybody else seems like it's working. And you kind of think about it like, what is wrong with me? How come it's not working for me? It could be possible that you're living in some type of disobedience in some area. That may sound a little hard because all of us have some areas of disobedience, but there's a specific thing that you're supposed to do that God is not going to compromise on. I hope you all hear me. And so that's why he says like now, it's like, it's almost like a curse on you. If you think about it, everything you touch is cursed. But it's not like that for everybody. See, the now affected everybody. But this one is only like it just affected you, specifically. Are y'all okay? Some of y'all like, ooh, Jesus. I, this is not one of those messages to beat you over the head and condemn you. But I do want to let some people know they may be watching or whatever. It could be us that's stopping our own blessing. All right. What verse that on? So he said he set a time and said tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did it. If God sets that time, it's going to happen. Only reason why it, got, it took God that long is because he's been trying to hold back this wrath to wait on you. But if you just insist on keep on doing your own thing, then the time will come where it seems like everything you touch is just not working. Then you're going to say the devil busy. It's not the devil. It's you. So he says right here, the next day the Lord did it and all the livestock of Egypt died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh sent men to investigate. It's almost like you're looking at everybody else now. I want to check out, okay, you're doing the same thing I'm doing. How come it's not working for me, but it's working for you? Maybe they're in obedience. They're doing what God called them to do. So Pharaoh sent men to investigate and not, one, not even one animal of the Israelites had died, yet he, his heart, was unyielding and he would not let the people go. After all of that, he still says, I'm not gonna change. And we look at him like, man, something is wrong with Pharaoh. Yeah, it's a spirit. It's that, that, uh, a stubborn spirit that just refused to change because you, you gotta have it your way, all right? All right, so watch this, boils. Oh Lord, now, I looked at this when it comes to boils, but let's, uh, let's just kind of see what happens. Uh, there's a lot of Bible in this teaching, obviously, but I'm a Bible teacher, so y'all got to bear with me. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from the furnace and have Moses toss it in the air in the presence of Pharaoh. It will be, become fine dust over the whole land of Egypt and festering boils will break out on men and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from the furnace stood before Pharaoh, Moses tossed it in the air, and festering boils broke out on the men and the animals. The magicians could not stand before Moses because the boils were on them and on the Egyptians. Pause right there. What are the boils, the boils, the boils? That's something, first he, you know, he just threw it in the air and it was just in the atmosphere and all of a sudden things start coming out of the people. Sickness can be a result of disobedience because you're just not doing what God calls you to do. Something from the inside coming on the outside now is causing sickness or decay, right? Um, am I saying God's behind the sickness? No, it's the devil. But sometimes when you don't allow God to move in your life, you open yourself up in disobedience for the devil to bring on different diseases that can come. And, and cause you not to even stand right. So you got to look at that now because sometimes it's like, you, I'm going back to Job a little bit, when he had this hedge of protection around him. You all know the story, some of you don't, but basically the hedge of protection around him was over his 
finances, his, his livestock, his cattle, his family, and over his body. And then Satan says, if you remove the hedge, he'll curse you. So God allowed him to, you know, take the, the finances. And then he started attacking the relationship. And then he started attacking Job's body. Then Job had to break a pot and start to scratch himself because he had all these boils on him. Now, the whole thing was for Job to curse God. See, Satan wanted him to curse God. But Job hold on to his integrity. My point is this, that God didn't send the boils on Job. That was a, a side effect that Satan used to get Job to get off into disobedience to curse him. So when it comes to this, because you are not in direct obedience with God, you can see things that are starting to come out of you that's not, that you know is not of God. Sickness. Well, let's look at spiritual sickness then. You, wasn't, you didn't even have a temper problem before. Because you've been outside the will of God, now all of a sudden you got like this other spirit on you that's causing you to react a different way. People looking at you like, what is wrong with you? You've never been like this. You've been in disobedience. And the more you kind of compromise in disobedience, you see different results starting to stand up and, and, and come out of you. And you can't even stand in front of the presence of God or the presence of godly people. Because it's something wrong. It's something off about you. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So we look at boils and we say, oh, that's not all that bad. But when it comes to it affecting your life, yeah, it is pretty bad. All right. So he says he had the boils happen and, uh, and, and they couldn't stand before him. But look at verse 12. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Look at that. So in other words, you see the, you see the, the yeah, you see how it progressed? First, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then all of a sudden, the Lord says, if you want to take it that far, then I will harden your heart. He gonna, yeah, so it's almost like the Lord says, if you're going to go that far, let's go all the way then. See, this is the danger of compromising. Because sooner or later, you may think it's just, that's just how I am. And then all of a sudden, the Lord hardened his heart. Because the Bible talks about in Romans, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy on. And then he talks about how he says, um, I raise up Pharaoh for this purpose so I can display my name in the earth. In other words, God will turn the children of disobedience into an example. I don't want God to make me into an example to other people and say, this is what you should not be doing. But some people, because they're so bent on being disobedient, God will turn them into an example then. So the Lord, everybody say the Lord hardened his heart. Watch this. And he would not listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord said. But at first, the Lord didn't harden his heart. He gave him a choice. But Pharaoh was just bent on that. And then even afterwards, I think uh, one of these scriptures, even after the Lord hardened his heart, Pharaoh took it even further of continuing to harden his heart when he could have just, just stopped it. All right, let's keep going. All right, the hell, the hell, the hell is hell mingled with fire. It's the worst storm you can ever go through. Hell and fire together is unnatural. But in this case, it was a, a special storm. You're not just going through something. It's specially designed for you. The Bible says right here, therefore, at this time tomorrow, I will send the worst hell storm that has ever fallen on Egypt from the day of his founding until now. Verse 19, give an order to bring in your livestock and everything you have in the fields to a place of shelter or a covering. Bring everything under the right covering, because when this storm hits, anything that's not covered is going to die. All right. And so you got to get to the point where you're like, I may be in disobedience, but I still love my children or I love my this or I love that. You better bring them into the, the, the covering then, because when you go through that storm, it's going to hit everything that's connected to you that's outside the covering. And so a lot of times your obedience will start to affect other people. Your disobedience, excuse me, will start to affect other people. You may think it's just between you and God, like you had this war between you and God. But no, it's starting to affect every area of your life. The Bible said this will be the worst storm you will ever see. There is a storm that God is holding back right now. And it's reserved for those people of disobedience. It's, that's also in Revelation. The Bible talks about the, the four angels holding back the, the last four storms of the earth. So we think we have storms now. There's worse storms that can be considered the worst storm you've ever seen in your life. The perfect storms. But God says you can go through a spiritually worse storm that you've ever had. You thought you just, oh, 
I lost this or I lost that and this was bad. No, there is a storm that will break you down to your knees. The worst storm, watch this. Bring in your livestock, everything you have in the field to a place of shelter because the hail will fall on everything, every animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field. Because they're just following you in disobedience, they're gonna get affected. You may say, no, that's not, it's not between you and them, it's between me. No, everything that you love, if you don't have a, a certain covering over it, then it can affect that. So he says, and they will die. Some people will go through a, a storm and won't recover because of your own disobedience. Usually it can be, yeah, children, family members, people who you love, your loved ones. They're going through something and they're innocent. They're bystanders. But because of your own disobedience, it's starting to affect their house. Are y'all okay? All right. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the Lord hurried and brought their stuff in. See, they, they smart. Those are the smart ones. The ones that say, I see what Pharaoh's doing. We about, we're, we're on the downward spiral, but I still fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. So I'm going to make sure that I'm listening to what God is saying. Even though I'm a little bit in disobedience too, I got enough sense to make sure that I'm getting under the right covering. All right. So those who fear the Lord heard to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. I think I got the next verse where it says basically it pummeled them all the way down. But I want you to kind of look at the, the, the storm, the hail storm mingled fire and, and, uh, and ice. Again, that's unnatural. But this is the storm that will break you down. And it says, I got the next one. Yeah, okay, here it is. Verse 22. Then the Lord says, stretch out your hand toward the sky and the hail. I'm going to skip over that. Uh, yeah, I might as well read it. Verse 23. When Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail. Lightning flashed down on the ground so that the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Throughout Egypt, uh, throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both men and animals, and it beat down every growing thing in the fields and stripped every tree. So in other words, everything that was uncovered, it beat it all the way down, whereas usefulness was, did, not, did not exist anymore. You can't use it anymore. It's been destroyed by the storm. And you go through a storm and you may have come out Okay, but everything that you had, your house or your car, your this or your whole livelihood, it's been, it's been taken away through the storm, okay? Now, I'm not one of those preachers that's, that, that, that preaches all the way about the storm, but I am telling you there is a certain storm that will break you down to your knees. And look at this. It says, the only place it did not have a hail is the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. So in other words, this storm is specially designed for you too. It's not just hitting everybody. It's only targeted at you, but everybody else who's in obedience with God, they're going through the, maybe the same storm, but it's not affecting them. You know, uh, you remember in 20, 2009 with the recession? And yeah, it was a hard time. The whole country went through the recession, but God still provided for his people. There's a lot of people, they may have lost their job, they probably had to transition to another job, but you know what, God made sure they still ate, they still had gas in their car, they still got to one place. It may be a little bit tough. I got, uh, what let me see, no, I, no, that was something else, but I, I was in transition from Memphis to Arizona during that whole heat of recession, but God made sure that we were still sustained. And that's how it is. When it comes to a storm on a nation, no matter who's in, Let's say who's in office or whoever's running this or whoever's in your house that, that has the final say. Uh, God's people will still be taken care of in that special storm. All right. Then watch this. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned. Yes. OK. I went through this storm and it's bad. I've sinned. The Lord is right and my people and I are wrong. Pray to the Lord that we have we've had enough of thunder and hell. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. Then Moses left Pharaoh and went out to the city. He spread out his hands and toward the, toward the Lord. And the thunder and the hail stopped. And the rain no longer poured down on the land. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the storm was over, had stopped, watch this, he sinned again. And he and his officials hardened their hearts. 
Everybody connected to him had that same stubborn spirit. And I see you shaking your head like, what's wrong with him? You know what? I say the same thing because it's like, how do you how do you see that God is being merciful all of this time and you still decide that you're going to harden your heart and everybody connected to you? Well, you'd be surprised how that spirit can take you all the way from zero to 100. It's a stubborn spirit. So we look at that as an example, and he is an example, but it just lets you know how far God is merciful because he can just just start out just killing everybody if he wanted to. But he he's getting your attention through these storms. Pharaoh hardened his heart and he would no he, he would not let the Israelites go just as the Lord said through Moses. Now, we're, that's what seven or was that eight? That was seven. So the last three the Bible talks about there was the three woes. The last three, I think, has more spiritual significance than anything else. See, you can relate to the to the storms of life. Some of us probably hadn't been through a storm like this yet, but it can be reserved for them. But let's look at these last three and then, uh, you know, hopefully we can get some obedience in here. Not that you all are in disobedience, but some of us probably are in disobedience. So anyway, this is a word that will wake you up. The locusts. Everybody say the locusts are coming. Say it again. The locusts are coming. If you know anything about the Bible, it talks about the locusts. They eat up everything. And somebody says, wait a minute, the hell already destroyed everything. Well, the hell destroyed everything that was on the surface. But there were some things underneath the surface that were almost in reserve. But the locusts are coming. They, they're the canker worms, the palm worms, the ones that eat up everything. Everything that the hell didn't destroy, the storm didn't destroy, the locust is going to finish everything. And the locusts have no king over them. So they have no way to tell them what to do. It just, they just go with the wind. If you know anything about locusts, all they got to do is feel the wind and they just kind of, because they don't fly, they coast on the wind. So all God has to do is just send a wind and they will go right in, in that direction. And when they come, they multiply. They come like, they can block out the sun when it's a lot of them. But when they come, they eat up everything that's living, everything that's green, everything that, that you still have left over from the storm. It's like, Lord, I only got this left over. Don't take this. The locusts are coming. The locusts are the ones that will eat up everything that's left. Are y'all hearing me? So sometimes people don't get it. They think, OK, I survived that storm. I'm over that thing. I don't think I'm going to go through that again. But now it turned around and now the locusts are coming now. So it says right here, verse, verse uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that they may so I may perform these miraculous signs. See, these are the last three woes because Pharaoh hardened his heart. I'm going to make sure that his heart all the way to the end so I can get what I'm trying to get to him. And it's official so, they, so I can perform these miracles, miraculous signs of mine among them. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over Egypt so that the locusts will swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields, everything left by the hail or by the storm. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind brought the locusts. And they invaded all of Egypt. In fact, say this word right now, invaded. invaded. So in other words, there are certain things that just kind of just came and stayed and invaded your house. You know, you probably just came out of that storm and it probably took out all of your life savings. And all of a sudden you got this brand new bill now that invaded the house. This brand new thing that you got to deal with now because it invaded the house. The Bible says all of Egypt settled down in every area of the country in great number. I'm sorry. They invaded all of Egypt and settled down. They didn't just blow through. They settled in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. So this picture doesn't even give it justice. The Bible says it will never, you will never see that many locusts again. So the whole land was actually filled with locusts. All right. Verse 15, they covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything grown in the fields and the fruit on the trees. Nothing green remained in Egypt or plant in the land of Egypt. In other words, Egypt now was a wasteland after the locusts came. Egypt was really a desert. At first, oh, Egypt looked like an oasis. It had some green, green leaves to it. But after the locusts came, everything was just sticks and it was dry and it was bare. 
And so you got to get to the point where you recognize, oh, my goodness, it's like I have nothing left. And so he says the fruit on the trees is gone. Nothing green in the land. Verse 18, Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord and the Lord changed the wind. Uh, I'm sorry. So it skipped down. It, I think it skipped from 15, 16. Basically, Pharaoh said, pray that the locusts leave. Moses then left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord changed the wind to a very strong west wind, which caught up the locusts and carried them into the Red Sea. Not one locust was left anywhere in Egypt. Watch this. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. I think at this point, Pharaoh wanted to change, but he could not change at that point. Y'all see what I'm saying? There, there is a point like, I, okay, Lord, I had enough. I had enough. But the Lord's like, no, you went this far. So it's like, let's just, let's just take it all the way to the end. Just, just get this whooping over with then. But it's like, Lord, no, I repent. I, I, really, I really am changed. But the Bible says the Lord hardened his heart. And he would not let Israel go. So that spirit was on him so much that God just hardened it this time. Because he got to make you into an example. So last, the second to last plague is what? The darkness. That's void from the presence of God. If you know anything about hell, the Bible talks about this outer darkness, darkness that can be felt. Now, hell, and when's the last time you had darkness that can, you can actually feel? Some of us can't have a point of contact with that, point of reference with that. But the Bible talks about there is a darkness that's so deep that you can actually feel it. And that's what happened here. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that darkness may spread over the land of Egypt. Darkness that can be what? Felt. You can actually feel this darkness. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and, to and total darkness covered Egypt for three days. No one could even see or leave his place for three days. Yet there was it, the Egypt, Israelites had light in their places where they lived. So it's this darkness about you or this dark time about you, the darkness that can be felt that is this separation from you and God. You used to be able to pray a little bit and talk and, and get some kind of breakthrough, but now it's at the point like you're almost on the, the other side, like the occult, the darkness that can be felt. And, you know, I mean, there's only one plague left, but you're at the point where you're just, you're, you're so out there now. And it only just started in, in areas of disobedience because you did not respond when he told you to, to move forward. And look how far it's gotten you out, out there. The darkness that can be felt. But there's other people that are still walking around with light, you know? And it's like, what are they doing that I'm not doing? There may be in obedience in areas that you're not in obedience. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron, go worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. See, there he go. He could have just said, oh, y'all just leave. All y'all leave. We ain't got nothing. There's no green here. There's no money here. There's no f cattle here. We ain't got nothing but all this darkness. Y'all can go and take the darkness with you. He could have said that, right? But he wanted to have some control. Y'all leave, but leave your flocks here. How in the world are you going to sacrifice with no flocks? But he had that stubborn spirit that he can't even see that Egypt is already ruined. You already lost. And sometimes people don't even recognize you lost. It's already gone. You might as well just jump in obedience because you have nothing else left to do. But he says, no, I got to have some control. So you need to leave your flocks behind. And there it is. It's like that's how the Lord has hardened his heart there because he could have just stopped it right there. But verse 25, but Moses said, you must allow us to have our sacrifices and burnt offerings to the present to the Lord our God. Our, God, uh, our livestock is too much. Uh, our livestock too much too must go with us. Not a hoof will be left behind. In other words, when God tells you to do something, make sure you don't compromise. You get everything God told you to do. All right. So he says, not a hoof will be left behind. We have to use some of them to, in our worship in the Lord. How else are we going to worship the Lord without a sacrifice? Until we get there, we will not know what we are going to use to worship the Lord. Here it is. Verse 27. Y'all see it. Say that out loud. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Again, I personally believe, and I could be wrong, 
I believe there probably was a part of Pharaoh that he wanted to kind of like stop there, but that spirit was on him too much. That the Lord says, no, we got we to gotta turn it all the way up. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Your words were falling on deaf ears, Moses. They're not going to hear you. Some people are in, in such disobedience that no matter what you say, they're not going to hear you. Why? The Lord has hardened their heart. And you got to let them, you got to let them go. Let them just experience what they're going to experience because they ain't listening to you. They ain't going to listen to you and you may say the right thing, but they still not hearing you. They got to learn on their own. Let them go. The Lord hardened his heart and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you don't appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. So now he got wrath on him. It's the last person you want to be mad at is Moses when he's the one who can stop all these plagues. But anyway, verse 29, just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. You all know the last plague. And before I go there, I just want to talk about this, this darkness part right here. The darkness is, I think, um, to me, one of the worst things because you don't know where you're at anymore. When you're in darkness, you just go on by what you feel. So you're being more led by your emotions by, than by the spirit. And so sometimes if you find yourself just reacting and not seeking the face of God, it could be you're blindly in the darkness. And I think that that is the time where you should just stop everything and say, Lord, I need your light. I need to see what you need me to see, you know. Uh, but some people get so far out there that nothing can help them. There's only one thing that can really just turn them around, and that's when you affect their children. And that's the last plague, the generational curse. Because you did not respond to it, it will affect your children. If God can't, it's only like God couldn't get you. And it's, let me say it like this, because God has been trying to get you, but Satan desires to steal, kill and destroy. So since he has you, he's also going after your generation, your seed, your next, the, the next people coming after you, the innocent ones who didn't do anything wrong. But because they're connected to you, the Bible talks about in chapter 11, and I'm done. Now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on, on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. So Moses said, so Moses, Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight, I will go through the land of Egypt and every firstborn of Egypt will die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn of the slave girl who's at her hand mill, and the firstborn of the cattle as well. So it starts from the top, Pharaoh, down to the bottom, the slave girl, to everything else that, that's you know, working, that's innocent, the cattle. So some of these people had nothing to do with, with this whole thing, but they're getting affected because of your own choices. And so you don't want your innocent children or grandchildren or people that are just connected to you to be affected by your own decisions of disobedience. All right, and so, there will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark or an animal or, or a man or an animal. Then you will know. See, that's the thing. Then you're going to know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me bowing down before me saying, go, and all your people will follow you. After that, I will leave. Then Moses hot with anger, left Pharaoh. Verse 9, the Lord uh, had said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Pharaoh has refused to listen to you so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. There's a purpose behind his disobedience. Verse 10, Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. And so I, I say this, and I'm going to read this last part right here. Uh, I say this because when, when God starts to make an example out of you in a worse way, you have to make sure you got to, number one, it didn't, it, it didn't have to come to that point. That's what I'm trying to, I think that's what I'm trying to point at the most, is that 
Some of the things that we go through, it didn't have to get that far. But because we insist on just kind of just staying in our own comfort zone of disobedience, it takes us from this negative faith to another negative faith, to a negative glory, to another negative glory. Y'all get what I'm saying? And it gets you deeper and deeper and deeper because you're, you're thinking that, you know, I got this under control. But little do you know that it's actually affecting everybody coming behind you. So, yes, it hit Pharaoh and his family first. But everybody else who was connected to him, it had to hit them too. All right. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down. You all know the Passover story, but I'm going to read it again. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you and your houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destruction or plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. That's why it's so important to have the blood, the lamb for your own house. You can't use the lamb for somebody else's house. That lamb has to be in your house. The blood of Jesus has to be upon your house. It's good to come to church and hear and everything, but if you don't take the blood or the lamb home, there's no blood on your house. So you have to cover your own house. Everybody, every head of the household had to cover their own house. No destruction plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborns of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh first, who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all of Egyptian got up during the night and there was a loud wailing crying in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. There was not a house where somebody was not affected by that area of disobedience. And I'm trying to tell you that there's a, it's a stubborn spirit. It's Pharaoh's stubborn spirit that caused you to get into an area where you just can't recover anymore. Okay? Um, I threw a lot at you all today, I know that. But one of the things that I pray for, you know, the people that I preach to and teach is that if you're going to do anything, make sure you stay in the will of God. You know? Um, you're going to get some times when you're going to get off, but you got to eat humble pie enough to say, Lord, I missed it. And because if not, you may think you're in control and have all the power. Egypt never recovered from that from that point. Yeah, they're probably around still as a nation, but they are not the same Egypt as they were before. And it's a shell of them. And I'm saying that basically you can be at a point where you think you're up, but you're still in disobedience and you're still stubborn. You still haven't learned enough. And it's like Satan will take you all the way through the ringer. And then years go by, sometimes I run into people, years go by, I look at them and I can tell they've been beat up, beat up by Satan, you know? And it's sad because they, they had the same chance as everybody else, but they just decided to just kind of stay in disobedience. So my prayer is that we don't have this feral spirit of stubbornness, you know? Um, the day you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Because you already know the evolution of it is sooner or later you get out there, God's going to harden it for you. So you have to kind of like stop and say, Lord, help. I don't want to be in disobedience. And sometimes that may take you practicing repenting every single day. Yeah, that's a little old fashioned, but you need to do that. You need to say, Lord, help me today because your mercies are new every morning. I need that mercy every single morning because I know me. I'm about to get out there and I'm going to mess something up. So help me to Help me in my unbelief. And so that's how we got to do. And um, I'm not sure if I have any music here, but did you all get anything out of that? Yes. I hope so. It was a lot of teaching, a lot of music. No, not music. A lot of uh, things going on. And uh, yeah, I think that song is appropriate a little bit. You can keep that playing. Because we do fall. And we got to know that you can get back up. That's good right there. In fact, a little more. I'm going to pray for you all and I'm going to let you all go. In fact, come on, uh, stand on up, please, if you don't mind. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this time. I thank you, Lord, right now, God, that the people that we have here, Lord, and the people that's watching, you have plans and purposes for them. Help us, Lord, not to be like Pharaoh, 
I pray, Lord, right now, God, as just the, the leader of this church, that you give us a, a spirit of obedience, not a spirit of disobedience. Remove the stony heart in our lives, God, and allow us, Lord, to have a heart of, of flesh. Forgive us, Lord, for, for the things that we are making excuses for, allowances for, and the hope that we will just kind of grow out of it. But let the word of God come to us to such a point, Lord, that it will break up the hard hearts. And Lord, I pray God right now for each one of these people, Lord, that they not just hear this word, but they will actually go out and apply it. We read in the story that it was people who feared the Lord, even though they was in disobedience, they feared the Lord and you still had mercy on them. And I'm not saying that these people are in disobedience, Lord, but we all have areas of disobedience. I pray, Lord, that we have enough humility to bring in the things that won't be destroyed. Now, I just want to just uh, speak a blessing over you all, if you don't mind. Lift your hands. I pray for the blessing of the Lord to be upon your life right now, that you will hear him in areas where you didn't hear him before, that you will see him in areas that you did not see him before that you'll begin to, to move in areas of obedience that will take you from a higher level in your life. That you will not go back and you will not uh, play around and you will not compromise. But Lord, let a spirit of obedience, Lord, to invade their life, Lord. Allow them to cover their house, Lord, with the, with the blood of Jesus, Lord. So that the plague, so that these, 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 these things won't come upon their house, Lord. And I just speak blessings over their life right now in the name of Jesus, God, that you are moving even now, not by what we feel, not by what we see, but what we believe right now. And I just speak the word of God on their life that they will be uh, in obedience. And they'll be obeying and they'll reject things that they didn't even want to reject. They're gonna wonder, how come I don't wanna do this anymore? How come I don't wanna do that anymore? Lord, let a spirit of obedience be upon their life right now. Dry out every single fault, every single vice, every single type of spirit that's trying to connect to them. Drive it out right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that your power has made us whole. I thank you, Lord, right now that your word has made us built up, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that they will have victory and they are walking in victory right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to Upon the Rock broadcast. If you enjoyed this message, please visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for a free download. Also, please be sure to share this message with your family and friends on social media sites to help spread the word of God. Have a great week.